Please turn to 1 John chapter 2 this morning. 1 John chapter 2. We camped out in chapter 1 for about six weeks or seven, maybe eight. And we'll be camping out in uh, 1 John chapter 2 verse 1 for this whole sermon. Only one verse today. 1 John chapter 2 verse number 1. We're looking this morning at Jesus, our advocate at heaven's court. Isn't that awesome? Jesus is our advocate in heaven's court. What an awesome Savior we have. 1 John chapter 2, and we're just going to look at verse number 1 this morning. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. What an awesome Savior we have. He tells the devil how it is 24-7 on our behalf. Isn't that great? It is so great. What a great God we have. I just want to throw this little note in here before I pray and we begin. The Holy Spirit is our helper on earth, while Jesus is our helper in heaven. So we, we have, the whole Trinity is involved in our lives. We go straight to the Father in prayer. We confess to Him. And the Holy Spirit is guiding us in our life right now as we ask Him to do that, as we ask Him to fill us and guide our footsteps. And the Lord Jesus is representing us in heaven. Triune God, all working on our behalf. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning. We give you praise. We give you thanksgiving. Indeed, all the glory goes to our great God in heaven. Uh, we take uh, no credit for anything down here on the earth. Anything that we accomplish for you is because you've empowered us. You've enabled us. You have answered our prayers to help us. But you've made it happen. And so we're so thankful for that. We're thankful that we can be the tool in your hand, that we are your servants, that we are children of the King. And we ask this morning you would guide us uh, uh, in uh, this message today in, in this one verse. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill me now for this message. Guide me, direct me, my thoughts and, and my words. Uh, we want to see our great Savior, Jesus Christ, lifted up, lifted up on high. Uh, we want to hear uh, from our great God in heaven. And so uh, we ask you to help us right now. And we ask that uh, the truths we look at today in this one verse will be a, a blessing to us, will be a help to us, will give us confidence in you, uh, will take us on our way rejoicing, and will help us uh, to live bolder and better for you in this upcoming week. So thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for being our great God and our Father. We look to you right now in this message today, and we ask all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's just read that verse one more time. Jesus, our advocate at heaven's court, my little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, if I were to address you this morning as my little children, most of you would laugh. I already saw the smile start because uh, even though I'm 65, a lot of you look at me as a kid. Because you're way past 65. And so, you know, I can't say that to you. I can't say my little children. A couple of you, maybe. By and large, not. But John, he could say that. John could say that. He, and so it's exactly what he says. My little children. Now, why does he say that? Well, because he's in his 80s. And uh, he's been walking with the king all these years from his youth on up. And as he writes these words. And so he can say that. Uh, it was a term of endearment that he used for the believers that... that received all of his writings. 
And so he often addressed people as little children. And Jesus did the same for his disciples. He called them little children at times as well. So the Apostle John is well known for his love of the Lord Jesus and his love for the people of God. And so because of that great love and his age, he refers to his readers as my little children. Point number one this morning, and the only point we're going to get to today, Jesus is our advocate when we sin. Jesus is our advocate when we sin. So John indicates one of the purposes that he has for writing. What does the phrase, these things? I write these things. Well, what's all that? Well, what's he doing? He's thinking back to what we just spent six weeks on. He's thinking about verses 5 to 10 in chapter 1. He reflects on this, and he perhaps is worrying that some will misunderstand what he's trying to say. And so he is going to go on in chapter 2 and keep on explaining things that we need to know. And so there are two possible misapprehensions that John might be concerned about as he writes this first verse in chapter 2. Number one is some people, some believers might be thinking, if sin is a reality and it is impossible for me to live a perfect life, why bother? Why bother trying not to sin? If I sin, big deal. God's going to forgive me for it. People think that. They really do. They still think it today. So John worries that, that some Christians will think sin is to be accepted as an inevitable part of the normal Christian life. We could call that the no big deal syndrome. And then secondly, others might think, as a Christian, I have liberty and am no longer under the law. So I can do whatever I want to do. If I sin, God will forgive me. There are people who live like that, too. Uh, they're the professors who you really don't know if they're saved or not. Because the fruit is not there. They are not living it at all. Some misuse Romans 5, 20 and 21. With little part says, where sin increased, abounded, grace abounded more. So they use that. Oh, okay, I'm good. I can sin. It's kind of like some folks that go and confess their sins and then they're good. They can go out and drink the rest of the weekend. God gives grace, so let's just sin away. We're going to get the grace, so let's just sin. We could say that this passage might be considered something of a spiritual clinic with the caution, watch out that you don't sin. But if you do, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. John is making a point. I am writing these things so you won't regard sin as an inevitable part of the Christian life and so that you won't presume on Christian liberty by thinking that sin is no big deal. So we do not want to think like those two things at all. Christians are saved from sin. We are not saved to sin some more. If you think about it, Christians are caught between a rock and a hard place. We cannot reach sinless perfection here on earth in this life. Yet we are commanded not to to sin. That's called being squished between a rock and a hard place. The point is, we should have a goal 
to live day by day without committing sin, without committing sin in thought, word, or deed. That is a tall order to fulfill in our life. And certainly, Christians ought to be people who sin less after salvation than they did before. And our prayer needs to be that the Lord will help us to sin less and less and less as the days go by. That is a good goal. That is possible to be reached. We should be moving towards holiness and away from sin. Sin is a serious thing in our lives, and we should never, ever take sin lightly at all. However, John is a realist about sin. He knows that Christians do sin. He is a Christian. He knows that he sins. And that is why he uses the word if. If any man sin is a statement that is unqualified as to the person. Young, old, spiritually mature or immature, people, pastors, missionaries, everyone is included. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Thank God for that. No one has a privileged status as a Christian. There is no statement about categories of sin or sins God will forgive and those that he will not forgive. John's not going there at all. He just says, if any man sin, any person, any sin. Think of it this way. Our debt is paid, but we are ever incurring fresh debt. <laughs> Our past sins are all forgiven, but every day we are committing some sins, and so we are incurring fresh debt, and we need fresh forgiveness for those sins. Why is it that we can have our sins forgiven? Why is it that we can have our sins forgiven? Well, John says it's because we have an advocate. We have a lawyer. We have a defense attorney who stands in the court of the Father. And he's always there. And he's always on duty. Every time we need to confess, he is there. He is our advocate. The word advocate means one who is called alongside to help in time of need. And John uses this word several times in his gospel concerning the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian. The word there is translated helper. John talks about our helper in reference to the Holy Spirit. Here, the word is translated advocate because it means one called alongside to help. And it means one who lends his voice in our defense. One who speaks up on our behalf. Jesus is our advocate in court. The court of heaven. Now get this, as a true believer, you actually have two advocates. You have two advocates. The first advocate you have is the Holy Spirit who indwells you. And, and what does that advocate do? He comes along beside you to help you and mostly convict you of your sin. He's there to convict. He helps us to see this is sin. This is what I have done. And then secondly, we have an advocate in heaven, Jesus Christ, who speaks to God on our behalf. He's our lawyer. He is our advocate in heaven. So 
Here on earth, we have the Holy Spirit living within us, and he advocates, he convicts us, he directs us, he shows us the way to go as we ask him to do that. Check out Hebrews 7, 25. Wherefore, he is able to also to save them to the uttermost. They come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So Jesus right now ever lives in the court of heaven as our advocate. Going back a few years, and many of you will recognize this, from 1957 to 1966, there was a program on TV about a criminal defense lawyer. What was that called? Perry Mason. <laughs> Perry Mason. Now, even as, as a boy, I really enjoyed watching that. I was only eight years old the last uh, season. But I liked that one, and there was another one that was on it talked about lawyers and yelling and screaming in court, which they really don't do. They just dramatize that on TV. But man, as a little, I wanted to be one of those. Yeah, I want to be in court. I want to be in there yelling and screaming and hollering. So now I do that from the pulpit instead. So I want to do that. I was fascinated. But, you know, in all the years of Perry Mason, as he was on TV, guess what? He never lost a case. Did he? He never. I have news for you. We have an advocate called Jesus Christ who never, ever lost a case and never, ever will. And he had a whole lot more cases than Perry Mason. And has more cases today, right now, this moment. <laughs> Jesus never loses a case in the court of heaven. Jesus, our advocate, never lost and never will lose a case. Jesus pleads your cause and my cause in the court of heaven. He is Jesus, the righteous one. Jesus is my advocate because he paid for my penalty on the cross of Calvary when he died for my sins as my substitute, and you can put your name in there too. Jesus is our only advocate. There are no advocates on this earth that can help us in the court of heaven. The Pope can't help us, the preacher can't, the evangelist can't, the rabbi, the imam, the priest, the missionary, or the TV huckster. None of them can help us in the court of heaven. Only Jesus, our advocate. We have only one advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The reason he alone is my advocate is because he alone paid for the price of my sin and your sin at the cross of Calvary. In a courtroom, there are four main players. All right, let's go to court. The first one you have is the judge. Got to have the judge. And where is he? He is front, center, and elevated your honor. You have the judge, and then you have the prosecuting attorney. You have the prosecutor, and then you have the defense attorney, and you have you and me, the defendant. The defendant. Those are the four main players. Now picture this in your mind. Who is the judge? It is God the Father. He is the judge. The prosecutor is Satan himself. He's there all day, 24-7, accusing you and me and every other believer. The prosecutor is Satan. You and I, we are the defendants. We are the accused. And last but not least is Jesus, our defense attorney, our advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he never loses a case. Never, ever. The prosecuting attorney, the devil, 
he approaches the bench and he accuses you and he accuses me to God the Father. Did you see what he did? I can't believe she did that. This is one of your children, God, and they did this. They're bad, terribly. Wow. But then what happens? So the devil's there to accuse, but then your defense attorney speaks. Jesus Christ. What does he say? He says, yes, Father, he is guilty of that sin. But I went to the cross and I died for that sin. When he was a five-year-old boy, through faith in me, my atonement was applied to him, and his sins were forgiven. I put my robe of righteousness on him. He is covered in my blood, and he is forgiven because he is my child. And with that, the devil has to leave. He's done. Loser. He's got to go. In the modern legal world, the defense attorney defends the defendant on the merits of the defendant's own self. In John's thought, however, the merit on the part of the accused is entirely absent. All of the merit is on the part of the advocate. In the legal world, it is not permissible for an attorney who is involved in the case to be related to the judge. But in the court of heaven, that is exactly the way it is. Jesus is the son of the judge. Wow. In heaven's court, it's legal. Jesus, the son who loves the father, and the Father who loves the Son serve as advocate and judge. Now that's what you call a winning team. You are never going to defeat them. Jesus, our advocate, can stand face to face with God as his Son in relationship and fellowship because Jesus is divine. Jesus is Trinity. In the legal world, it is also impermissible for the defense attorney to be related to the defendant. Oh, you can't have that down at the courthouse either. But again, in heaven's court, it is perfectly legal. Jesus can represent us as our advocate because he is fully human calls us his brothers in Hebrews chapter 2. And as Hebrews 4.15 says, was he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Jesus, our defense attorney, has never sinned. Sometimes we may think that Jesus does not understand our predicament that he doesn't really get what we're going through right now. I wonder if he really cares about this. But Jesus is fully qualified to serve as our advocate when we sin, because he knows what it is to be tempted. And he was tempted more powerfully of the devil than any human being ever has been tempted. As a man, he too was awfully tempted, but he never ever sinned. Jesus' intercession for us is not temporary, and it is never interrupted. Our forgiveness, him being our advocate, is 24-7 milliseconds. He is our advocate. That is never ever interrupted. Though accomplished in time, it is eternally valid and continuous. 
It goes on and on. As soon as we are convicted of sin, we may run to Jesus Christ, our advocate. He wins the case, and court is adjourned. Done. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for the court of heaven, especially as it regards us as your children. We are so thankful this morning that Jesus Christ is our advocate, that he is there with the Father. He is letting him know all day, every day, this is my child, I've taken care of this. He is forgiven. My blood is all over him. He has believed in me as his personal savior. Wow. What a great and awesome God we have and serve in these days. May these truths we looked at today be a real help and a blessing to our hearts as we walk a victorious pilgrim pathway here on earth. We give you praise and we give you thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.